Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. You are listening to the Trek Ranks podcast, a member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network. This is episode 56, featuring the top five shapes. Welcome, Star Trek fans. I am Jim Morehouse, and I am the host of the Trek Ranks podcast. And tonight, yep, we're doing one of those crazy abstract topics again. It's one of those ones that just popped into my head a few months ago, and I realized it would be a pretty good way to have an awesome conversation about Star Trek because this is Trek Ranks, and that's pretty much what we do. So we're going to do our top five shapes. That's it. It's that simple. Pick a shape in Star Trek. And we're going to talk about how awesome that you think it is. And speaking of awesome, I could not be more excited about our two guests tonight. We have one of our returning regulars, the great Jen Tiff, but also joining us tonight is that guy with the Twitter handle that I've struggled to relate to you <laughs> many times on Trek Breaks because it's got the star trek with no vowels and it's the board but it's t-e-h i don't know it's ross webster so jen and ross welcome to the show it's great to have you guys on hello thank you for having us very excited to to be here yeah thanks jim it's it's great to be back uh this, this episode believe it or not actually puts me in the uh five timers club for trek oh Ranks. i that <laughs> is that's good I, I, trek I, Ranks appearances <laughs> yes so i'm waiting for you know steve martin and chevy chase or maybe you know bill mann and alex perry to come and give me a smoking jacket or something and <laughs> that <laughs> is <laughs> that is fantastic i I do track that, but I did not notice that going in. Yeah, so yeah. I do have a, a, a list of that. Uh, Ross, you are, I did count this up though. I think you're guest number 47, if I've, uh, well, if I've we counted that up right. So we saved that for you because I know we've been trying to get you on forever. But I want you guys to quickly talk about Snap Trek because Ross and Jen host Snap Trek, one of my favorite podcasts out there. It is uh, brilliant. They compare two episodes with uh, an awesome kind of back and forth and rating system of of just the, the stuff they love in that episode. So it's super cool. So tell us a little bit about the genesis of that. I think it just came from an idea I had uh, that it would be a fun way to talk about Star Trek by comparing two episodes. And I put the idea out there on Twitter uh, just to say, wouldn't this be a nice podcast to, to listen to? And then... A few weeks later, I got a little message from Jen that said, uh, have you, are you thinking about doing that podcast? <laughs> and sort of went from there. I thought, oh, okay, yeah. if, it's that, if it's a good idea, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, I thought, I thought are, you, are you really going to do that? Because that sounds like a really cool idea. And then, you know, we got to talking about it and, re, you know, we refined the idea a little bit and, and uh, you know, and then there, just start it from there. And it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it is it's really always, enjoyable. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And the poetry aspect of it at the beginning is they, they each do a, a poem or a limerick or something about uh, each episode they're, they're contrasting, which is awesome. So if you haven't checked it out, check out Snaptrack. It is fantastic. And, okay, Ross, Thank really you. quick, what's your, what's your Trek origin story? How did you come to Trek and how do you kind of define your fandom? Uh, well, I think... I think I've always watched Star Trek from as, as, as long as I can remember. Star Trek has been on television and it has been one of the shows that I have enjoyed watching more than all the other shows that are on TV. So reruns of the original series, the, the, the first airings of The Next Generation when I was very young and I was hooked. I, I've always been watching Star Trek all the way through. I can't think of a time when I haven't thought if there was an episode of Star Trek on TV, I would sit down and watch it. Right. I, I, I can't think of a time when I haven't watched it. Uh, you know, my dad was a big Star Trek fan. My brother's a big Star Trek fan. We just watch a lot of Star Trek in my family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And are you, have you seen it all? I was thinking about this because I knew you'd ask. I think I have seen it all, but because I've been reading about it, you know, magazines, books, articles, for sort of 30 odd years, I definitely know every single episode inside and out. That convinced me I've seen every single one of them. 
And I know when I got Netflix a few years ago, I went back through and mopped up the odd episode, which I knew I hadn't seen. So like, for some reason, Macrocosm, I had never seen. Wow. Like, I knew all about it. I, oh. I, I could tell you what happened in it, but I had never seen it. So I, I'd go back and mop, mop up some of the episodes I knew I hadn't seen. And I think I caught every single one of them. But just to make sure, I'm on, a, I'm on a, a, an original series rewatch right now. And I'm, I'm part way through Miri. And I'll be watching that after this. Okay. I, I love it. I, I mean, we've got two Star Trek experts on the show tonight. That oh. I know for sure. Okay. Let's jump into a quick Trek Ranks recalibration. What are you recalibrating? Everything. Um, it's, it's a sweeping, uh, a recalibration of all systems. As regular listeners will know, general order number one here at Trek Ranks is that we love Trek. We love to rank Trek via some deep dive topics just to get the conversation started because that's our favorite thing to do is just to talk about Star Trek. Infinite diversity. In infinite combinations. And as the Vulcan master and young angry Tuvok just said, there are no wrong answers here at Trek Ranks. Our show is about all the reasons we love Star Trek. We're not here to nitpick or to argue, but just to celebrate the greatness of Trek. We love it all, from TOS to TNG, straight through to Enterprise and the Kelvin timeline, and now Discovery as well. It's all fair game here on the Trek Ranks podcast. Black alert. Black alert. And a quick reminder that Discovery spoilers are potentially in play. So with that in mind, tonight's episode is current through season two of Discovery. And one more reminder that we use the term episodes. It's just our quick and easy shorthand, but the 13 films are always in play as well. So most of you probably heard that before, but we like to reset every week for any newcomers jumping into Trek ranks for the first time. And on that note, a reminder that our entire back catalog is available for you to download and listen to at Trek ranks and at the tricordertransmissions.com because one of the beauties of our show is that each episode is pretty timeless. You can listen and re-listen to our shows in any order you want. So if you haven't come back to listen to uh, some of our back episodes or old episodes, we definitely encourage you to do that. You can do that with Snap Trek too. Another great thing about that show. <laughs> All right. You can find Trek Ranks on the interface links at trekranks.com and you can contact me directly on twitter at trekranks or at enterprise extra and you can also call and leave us a message with your own picks at 609-512-LLAP at 609-512-5527 all right jen and ross how can everyone get a hold of you guys on the net access interface jen uh on twitter i'm at edatquarks and i am as jim has said here we go. Am, Here we go. Try to. I never. I never thought I'd have to say it out loud when I <laughs> when I typed it in originally. I thought this would be fun. I'll talk to some people about Star Trek. I never thought I'd say it out loud. <laughs> I am Taborg T E H B O R G at S T R T R K seventeen o one. That's Star Trek seventeen o one with no <laughs> vowels. <laughs> Every time I every time I misspell the now Ross, I think of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Taborg. Okay, and, I think... and you can also you can also find a, a Snap Track on on Twitter. Also, just add Snap Track. Yes, at Snap Track. Track <laughs> down Snap Track. I'm going to keep saying it. Okay, I think we're ready to activate our level one diagnostic. Diagnostic cycle will be complete in 20 seconds. So to get us rolling tonight, we're going to kick off our shape of palooza our shape-tastic show, our shape-tacular. None of those are working, right? <laughs> okay. All right. We're, we're going to get into ship shape with our Trek shapes, and we're going to pick, that we're going to start. <laughs> yeah, that, okay. Like that Some of these will work. I'm editing all this out. No, I'm not. Okay. We're going to, uh, for the diagnostic cycle, we're going to talk about a non-Trek shape that we think is cool that we want to talk about just to kind of wet our whistle for what we think our picks might look like. So Jen, what's a cool shape outside of Trek that will give us a little preview of your list? Okay. So a pop culture shape that I love is the silhouette from uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. 
Oh, that's so, a great one. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just, you know, Joel or Mike or Jonah, you know, and, and the bots and a row, row of movie theater chairs, you know, just their silhouette at the bottom of the screen um, when they're in the theater watching the bad movie of the week, you know. I love it because it's a unique design solution to the problem of, you know, having your main characters not being the, vis the visual focus of, of the scenes, you know, but rather just their voices. So they're out of the way of the, what they want you to look at, but this way they're not just like disembodied voices, you know? I think yep. it's, it's a unique way to solve that problem. And, you know, it's an iconic to that show. And just seeing the sh that shape, you know, that silhouette just, you know, makes me, makes me happy knowing there's, you know, there's last coming, you know? <laughs> so I you, love that shape. You immediately know what that shape represents. That's, right. uh, that's a brilliant pick and exactly the kind of thing I was thinking we might uh, be tackling on this show. So how about you, Ross? What's your non-Trek shape? I picked a shape, which I think is sort of, it's ancient, and I think it's iconic the world over. I picked the, the, the crossbar created by the standing stones of Stonehenge. You know what I'm talking oh. about? Yes. Those two vertical right. stones, roughly hewn stones, and the crossbar across the top. I just think it's, you know, it's iconic you will absolutely know what you're talking about. I mean, I, I presume Stonehenge is one of those standing stone circles in the southwest of England. And it's just that shape it, is it. You know, if you, you could draw that pattern and people the world over will know this is the place that you're thinking of. This is the idea. Just from drawing those three oblongs. Whether it's the, the actual Stonehenge or the Stonehenge, I always think of the one in Spinal Tap. <laughs> with a, little, <laughs> <Micro> <laughs> a little mini <laughs> genius all right so for me i thought of a few things but when i, I kind of just ended up landing on this scene in apollo 13 when the mission control crew has to figure out how to adapt the the uh the scrubbers and fit a square peg into the round hole and they have that great scene where they dump everything out on the table and the guy holds mm -hmm. up a big he holds up like a, a box cube and a cylinder, like a round cylinder tube, and says, we got to make this fit into this, <laughs> use nothing but that, pointing at the table with all the stuff from the spacecraft spread out. I love that scene, and it's, uh, and it's so, it's just got these two really dis distinctive shapes in it, and uh, kind of jumped out at me right away, and I, so I went with that. I love these picks. I know this is going to be an awesome conversation so let's do it. Let's jump into our prime directives and kind of figure out how we broke down our lists. I do not concur with your captain's decision. She's following our prime directive. Define prime directive. So Jen and Ross, as we always do in the prime directives, give us a feel for, for how you approach this topic. And I'm wondering kind of what your specific criteria that you used maybe narrow down your list if, if you had any at all and how much you had to rack your brain. So Jen, what, uh, how about you? Okay. So, uh, I, I, I knew this list had to be very personal because best shapes is very subjective, you know, like I can't, there's not too many objective measures of what makes a good shape, you know, maybe most iconic, but that to me, that was less interesting than just what, I hate to use this phrase, but spark, what sparks joy? <laughs> oh. <laughs> me, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, like, like it, it, you know, conveying some sort of joy or some other sort of emotion, you know? And for me, in my prime directive, uh, I, I made uh, the shape itself had to be the cause of the joy. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, like for example, like the, the Delta. I love the Delta. Yep. And it's definitely an iconic Trek shape, but I love it because it represents Star Trek, not particularly because of the shape not particularly what it looks like you know what I got mean? it got so, it no that makes sense so yeah so that didn't fit my prime directive i'm looking more for things that the specific the specific shape itself is what makes me happy okay that is cool i'm trying to think if that that might fit a couple of mine probably not all of them but uh okay how about you ross so i looked for things that were sort of identified primarily by a shape and where the use of the shape was really powerful or mind-boggling or overwhelming often the shape is a great big striking visual and i created a list originally where nothing in it was small or subtle it was huge enormous shapes and then as it went on i tried to find a little more i tried to look for a little more subtlety and think about just how you know what a shape is because it, it's not just a 
sometimes it's not a, a thing it could be an idea or well we'll see as we go through but i tried to sort of stop stop being so massive uh, i wanted to pull it down into something a bit more unusual stop being just a big shape and start thinking what else could it be we're talking about a science fiction show mm. where a shape could be anything could be any concept or any yep. idea so it changed a little bit as i went along all right that's great oh so this is yeah that's very interesting i don't think i really thought about it in either one of those ways i did kind of my normal just zone out brainstorm that i like to do and i just start thinking about odd shapes or designs or elements that I've seen in track and just kind of brainstorm them all and then, and see where it takes me. One, one kind of definitive thing I did was I wanted to have a variety of shapes. So I didn't want to have like everything symmetrical or abstract or all 3d or some 2d. And I was thinking like architecture, but also like something that might just be a piece of art. So I definitely have a disparity in my list in that way, but really I just was thinking of iconic shapes and, and things kind of in the vein of the uh, mystery science theater silhouette guys mm -hmm. that, uh, that just makes me think of Star Trek. So yeah, I think this is going to be great. I'm thinking we're going to have 15 very cool, <laughs> unique picks, but we'll see. All right, let's do this third emoticon. It's time for the order of things. I am a Jem'Hadar. He is a Vorta. It is the order of things. Thank you, Third Emoticon. And as always, just a quick reminder on how we're going to go through the order of things. First, each of us will reveal our five-word summary and a hashtag to tease our pick. Then we'll reveal our shape, and we'll pick an episode that we think best highlights that particular shape and we'll talk it through a little bit. And at the end, if we've got any secondary system selections for the picks that just missed our list, we'll rattle those off as well. And as always, if we have any duplicates, make sure you listen for the Defiant Torpedoes. Okay, Jen, let's start with you. What's your number five pick for a Star Trek shape? Okay, my number five pick. Five words and a hashtag. Mechanical MacGuffin mystifies even Miles. Hashtag, they're better than Yamek sauce. This is the shape of the self-sealing stemple. Yes. <laughs> and the, the episode I picked is Deep Space Nine, season one, episode 15, Progress. Yes. Okay. So the shape of these things, it's basically, it's, it's like a trapezoidal prism. Yep. And it's got, you know, like cylindrical stems coming out of either side and it's asymmetrical. And, and it, which it's pretty interesting. If it doesn't pop into your head right away, if you saw it, you'd recognize it. But, um, but the reason I love this shape is because of how mysterious it is how mysterious it looks you know no one knows what these things do or what they're used for <laughs> including even chief o'brien which is a funny gag but they managed to really convey that ambiguity in the design um on one hand you look at this thing and it looks like it, it's just like an electrical you know black box like you can imagine that inside there's all these you know all this 24th century electronics but at the same time it also looks distinctly mechanical so you aren't exactly sure what the internals are of this thing, you know, especially since we don't know what it does, you know, or what it is. Um, but it's also, it's shaped vaguely like a treasure chest, you know, there's symbols on oh, it. Yeah. And it always uh, made me think of, you know, when the stems, with the stems on either side, it, it kind of uh, has always reminded me of the Ark of the Covenant from Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is another, you know, classic MacGuffin, you know? Yep. And it's just, this, it's, so it's a perfectly shaped MacGuffin. It makes me happy just, just looking at it. I just think it's, it's a funny gag and, and the, the, the shape of it really sells the gag <laughs> i've got nothing to add but self-stealing stumbles i mean it's just <laughs> one of the best kind of running gags throughout deep space nine it's totally a mcguffin which i love that i never really thought about it in those terms but it never has anything to do with actually anything um <laughs> Wow, Top that's, merchandise. That's better right. assemble in the sector. <laughs> that is just brilliant. I had forgotten what they look like until you described it. I went, oh, yeah, that's right, because they had them in their hands in that. That is amazing. Ross, what's your take on self-sealing stem bolts? They, it is such a great pick. I've just looked up a picture now to remind myself of what they look like, and they are so unusual. And everything you said is true. You have no idea really what they do. 
But yeah. we know they have some sort of value, though, because the No right. J Consortium managed to <laughs> trade them, <laughs> trade like a, 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 like a hundred gross off them. Right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> they must be good for something. Right. Uh, it's a hilarious pick. And your five words, I love the alliteration. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's genius. I could not be happier that that's our first shape pick, a definitive Star Trek shape for sure. Okay, Ross, what, how about you? What's your uh, number five pick? So my number five pick, patterns of force fields and light, hashtag grid reference. I have picked the yellow grid pattern yes. on the interior of the holodeck yes. created by myriad black squares and these bright <laughs> yellow lines something which is really stark when you watch it on television so iconic really stands out and just envelops the people standing in it (laughs) completely overwhelms them and it is so beautiful to look at and yet strangely calming you think this could be a bit bit maddening but actually it's very pleasant to look at um and i just think it's so striking uh you know, it really makes, it really stands out. It stood the test of time as a design, as a visual. That grid is gorgeous. It's so soothing. It's so soothing. It's like, it's like you said, so this was on my secondary systems. I love this pick. It's definitely one that I considered. What, uh, did you have an episode that you uh, tied it to? I did. I thought long and hard. I picked the last time which we saw it. Uh, Enterprise, these are the voyages. Yeah. Hmm. As uh, as they shut down the holodeck, just after Arch has given his speech, Riker and Troy exit the holodeck. That's sort of the, the last visual of the characters in an episode of Star Trek, as it was then. You did, really didn't even need to say the episode once you said it was the last time. I think everyone yeah. realizes that. That's, uh, that is fantastic. Jen, what's your take on the holodeck grid? Yeah, it's interesting. I find it calming too. And I wonder if it's just our nostalgia, you know, right. for, for that shape, but there is something really calming about it. Um, the other thing I like about it too is you can kind of maybe think of, of why it's broken down into a grid like that. You know, like maybe these sections are, you know, the sections of, of the hollow matrix. So, you know what I mean? Like, like they have to, yep. like, it, like it breaks it down into these uh, you know, discrete pieces to build up the hologram. You know what I mean? So it looks like it kind of maybe belongs there for a, a technical reason. <laughs> so it's an, it's a great design and I love it. It's a great pick. That is great. Jen's an engineer, by the way. I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to my number five pick. So I'm cheating right off the bat. Perfect. As I put my list together, I couldn't get two of these famous groundbreaking shapes for the series out of my mind and they're both kind of similar, so I'm combining them into one pick to kick us off since they're, since they're kind of the same. So my five words and a hashtag. Definitive silhouettes define Star Trek. Hashtag nacelles and pylons. And they are the silhouettes of the original Enterprise and Deep Space Nine. And I chose these, these iconic shapes because in the, in the design process of this, one of the directives that went into to making them was that if you just caught a glimpse of these shapes out of the corner of your eye, you would know what it is. Or I think in for D space nine, they said, if, if you see the, the station from your kitchen table, you know exactly what's on the television and they couldn't have done it any better. They're, they're both super distinctive and unique. And I love those two shapes. Anytime I catch them out of the corner of my eye, and I chose the Trials and Tribulations episode from Deep Space Nine because that's the only one where you see them wow. both. So, <laughs> yeah, Jen, what's your take on those two oh, definitive silhouettes? That's a great pick, and I like that you were able to combine them you know, into, into one episode. That makes sense. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, oh God, the Enterprise, e- even people who aren't familiar with Star Trek would, would recognize the silhouette of the Enterprise. You know, it's that yeah. iconic. And, and I'm, par- I'm partial to the, to the the looks at Deep Space Nine just because that's my favorite. But but it's it's it, it's beautiful. I mean, no other space station looks like that in, in right. any sci-fi. It's it, it's it's gorgeous, and I, that's a wonderful pick. Yeah, the designs. By the way, the designs were, of course, Matt Jeffries and Herman Zimmerman, two two legends. Uh, Ross, what's your take on those? Saucer slash nacelles is high up on my secondary systems list. <laughs> yeah, because it just 
it screams Star Trek, doesn't it? Not, not. It's the yeah. entire franchise right there in a circle and two oblongs. It's fantastic, and those silhouettes. You know, everyone the world over would look at that and think, "I, I, I know what this is. I, I know what's going on here." Um, and the yeah, combining them into one episode. A little touch of genius. Very nice indeed. Yeah, yeah. A, a classic Trek ranks cheat. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to round four. Jen, what's your number four pick? Number four pick. Toy, ice harvester, deadly weapon. Hashtag, it's quite the multitasker. This is the shape of the Yushan Tor yeah. uh, from Enterprise, <laughs> season four, episode 13, Unite It. Okay, so this is the Andorian weapon that Shran and Archer fought with for their duel to the death. You know, um, if, if you don't remember it, uh, the shape of it, it sort of looks like a stegosaurus. Yes, it's, it's like a, it's a curve yeah. with spikes all the way down. You know, it's back and it even looks like it has a tail. You know, so it always makes me think of the stegosaurus. And the spikes are great. Uh, you know, they, they make use of it. There's a great scene with with Shran sharpening each little spike you know, with a sharpening block, you know, it looks menacing. But the interesting thing about the shape uh, is that it's actually based on a real tool called uh, an ulu, um, which is used by the Inuit peoples of Alaska and Canada. Um, and it's used for many different purposes. It's a, mul- it's a multitasker. Um, and Tran says the same thing about the Ushan Tor. You know, it's, it's an ice miner soul and Dorian children play with them. <laughs> and <laughs> they're used in this, in this ritual combat. And I like it. It really does look like a weapon that ice planet aliens would use, chipping away, you know, at, at, their, uh, at the person they're, they're fighting. But it, it, it also seems particularly Andorian to me. Because you could totally see them picking something so utilitarian yep. for their weapon as their weapon of choice, you know? And also just the fact that the shape of the weapon is such that you, you have to get up really up close with the person you're fighting to use it, you know, which also just really fits the Andorian. You know, they're going to look you in the eye and slit your throat. <laughs> so, so it's just, it's just such a, you know, it's just such a well-designed weapon um and i'll visit this theme again with my number one choice but i'm always interested in design choices uh that really work to fit with the the characters that the object belongs to right you know and i think here they just they really uh took a lot of time to think about what kind of weapon you know weapon the andorians would use and 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 it's it's just such a lovely beautiful design love that shape your prime directive is perfect because your list is giving me joy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I love that design and that weapon. I knew yeah. exactly when you do your five words, what you were talking about. It's fantastic. It's also great for cutting off the antennae right. of an Andorian. So Ross, what's your take on the Ushan Tor? I think I pronounced that right. I love the description you gave of it because it does look like a Stegosaurus. Um, yes. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it sounds really perfect. I couldn't even describe that as a shape. It's a un- it's a shape all of its very own, which is impressive in its own right. That's a that's a thing into itself. And um, yeah, a, a cracking idea. Well done. Brilliant, brilliant pick. Love this list. All right, Ross, what's your number four pick? So my number four, fascinating. All those right angles. Hashtag dice with death. And I have unsurprisingly picked a Borg cube as the <laughs> shape. Of all yes. shapes, which is just a mammoth shape, which is coming at you through space. It's filling you with fear and intimidation. Yep. Oppressive, massive, monolithic. I absolutely love the Borg cube. I love the Borg in, the, in general, but the, the cubes as a design idea, just to have a single cube coming at you through space. It is so threatening and it is just completely impersonal, there's no top or bottom to it. It just is. And you're going to have to deal with them because they are right in the way. I absolutely love the design of the, of the cube. I think it really personif- it doesn't personify the Borg, that would be wrong, but it really demonstrates their attitude and their society. It's really striking. And the episode I picked was um, Scorpion Part 1. A great cold open mm-hmm. where Voy- where the, the Borg are coming towards the screen and then they're destroyed by the by the species eight four seven two energy beam. But you, you don't know that just yet. And then later on, fifteen Borg cubes coming at the at the Starship Voyager 
Chakotay's, you know, feeling quite threatened, but they're obviously they're obviously on the run doing something else. They're, they're dealing with species 8472 rather than being interested in Voyager. But the threat is absolutely menacing. And, you know, from, from a square, you know, how, how, how bizarre that a square can fill you with such dread. But I absolutely love the design. I think it's completely awesome. Yeah, that is... I'm so glad somebody picked the Borg you. <laughs> if we... Uh, if, and I'm, all, I'm tracking to see if, if uh, our picks will equal the UPN logo as well. So we have a square. <laughs> <laughs> we have the square. So we're in good shape. Uh, that is a genius pick. The thing about the Borg that I think was so great is how they just nailed it right off the bat in Q-Who. Mm-hmm. The first, if you, again, you have to sometimes transport yourself and think back to that first time you saw it and not the fact that you've seen it a thousand times now. Right. That first, it was so, so threatening and ominous. You just had no idea. It was such a unique villain with uh, out being able to communicate to them. Just genius. Yeah, they were terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying in that episode. So, mm-hmm. Jen, what's your take on the Borg Cube? Yeah, I, Raj, you, you said it when you, when you said it was impersonal, you know, and that somehow that makes it more ominous. You know, all these, like you said, you know, the right angle, all the right angles thing. Um, the thing about a, a big cube like that can just be split into little cubes, sort of like the big board collective can be just split down into these, yeah. you know, different sections of, of drones and then to a single drone. And it, it's just that, oh, it, it, it's, it, it, it really... The same all the way down. Yeah. It's, it's completely identical. Yeah, and, and, and that makes them terrified. It's the perfect ship for, for, this, for this villain. I, I like that pick a lot. And just as, a, as an aside, the uh, five words is Odo's description of being a cube, uh, which he mentions in The Begotten fascinating all those right angles that's his opinion of, oh. of existing as a cube oh that's amazing <laughs> i'm so glad you said that because this is the kind of uh usual brilliant insight i expected from ross webster on trek ranks because <laughs> the lists he submit always have these kind of little tweaks on them i love it that's genius <laughs> i'm thinking the ushan tour could be the p in upn too so we'll see. that can count okay yeah. all right all right <laughs> Okay, let's go to my number four pick to close out the round. Five words and a hashtag. Ubiquitous oval outside Denorius belt. Hashtag Bajor for Bajorans. It's the Bajoran insignia. And this is kind of like my architecture pick. So my last pick was silhouettes. This one's architecture. I love the Bajoran insignia. I love this oval shape. They use it everywhere. Com badge. It's like building architecture, doorways, it's wall art. And my favorite piece is when they use it, it's from the episode I picked from Deep Space Nine Season 3, Explorers, when Cisco was building the Bajoran lightship and the little windows on the side are the Bajoran insignia. And I love this shot where Jake shows up and he's looking through the window smiling through the Bajoran logo. I I just love that beautiful symmetrical design, and it to me it just uh, screams Deep Space Nine whenever I see it, and it's all over the place if you look for it in uh, in the background of all the production design for for DS Nine. So Bajoran insignia is my pick. Ross, what's your take on that? It is a beautiful insignia, and it's it's so ornate, and it has that kind of it sort of screams sort of history it's not it's not such a utilitarian design as as the sort of the delta it there's a bit it seems there's a bit more history to it and a bit more uh care taken over it's a bit more ornate and i think that sort of speaks to their religious history and their religious understanding it's a beautiful pattern and a wonderful thing yeah i love ornate that's a great word to describe it jan how about you on the bajoran insignia yeah it definitely is ornate and and it's also um a, a a beautiful contrast to the Cardassian logo. Mm, yeah. um, it's kind of almost the exact opposite, you know. <laughs> right. If you actually think about it, which I never have, that's a that's an interesting comparison. But we'll we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about that. But yeah, but that's a great choice. Yeah, hopefully we'll have some more logos because I love a good Trek species logo. I love that just every species has their own logo. I love that. It's fantastic. (laughs) 
Thank you, Mike Okuda. <laughs> okay, let's go to the soup round, round three. Jen, what's your number three pick? Okay, so for the soup rounds, I tried to keep this off my list, but, uh, you know, but I, it's not because it's an obvious one, but I just couldn't. Okay. Okay. Why words and hashtag? A beloved cynical marketing gimmick. <laughs> hashtag, I wear it to honor you. And this is the shape of the Vulcan Itic. Yes, the Itic. Round of applause. The Round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> the episode I picked is uh, Enterprise Season 4, Episode 21, Terra Prime. Oh, okay. oh so, now I'm gonna cry. Yeah, oh, I'm already so, crying. I'm yeah, already... you know, I, I know the history. I know Gene Roddenberry designed it just to hawk merchandise, but I just don't care. You know, <laughs> that that would diminish it more to me if it, if this if it was only mentioned in the original series and that was the end of it. You know, but it became bigger than that. You know, when when it's been expanded on. You know, in Deep Space Nine and Enterprise and 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 even Discovery. And and Quark plays on the history of it. Uh, there's there's an episode where he wants to sell Idix on the promenade, and and Cisco won't give him a permit, you know. And he's <laughs> like, right. well, "What if I donate, you know, two percent of my profits to the Bajoran, you know, War Orphans Fund?" Oh my <laughs> god, <laughs> so great! <laughs> yeah. But uh, but now it's just it's just a beautiful piece of Trek lore. Now. I love the idea of it, and I love the shape of it. I love the the interlacing, you know, different geometric shapes and different metals, and it really mimics the you know the in universe meaning of it. Um, I had an interesting experience a little while ago. I had an an idic pin on my coat. An older woman said she liked my pin, and then she asked me if it was an angel. Oh, mm. you're like, uh, no, it's Mount Salea. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so at first I was, I was at first I was really taken aback by that, you know. Um, but then, um, you know, I'm, you know, but that, but then I thought about it, and uh, I could see how she would interpret it like that. Like if you put the circle on the top, it does really kind of look like an abstract angel. Mm -hmm. hmm. That made me think about how the Vulcans use the Itic. Um, and there's something beautiful about using the symbol of logic and diversity this in kind of the same way that people use religious icons you know as a source of comfort and mindfulness but without needing a supernatural element to it yeah. um, and, and of course then that made me think about the scene in the episode I picked Tara Prime when T'Pol hangs her mother's edic over baby Elizabeth's crib in sickbay the way someone might hang in a, you know an angel and um, same emotions can be ascribe to that without there having to be anything other than just, you know, the mathematical beauty of these shapes and the logic of the message behind the symbol, you know, and, and it just, it just made it that much more special. I'm so glad I was really close to picking the Idic, but did not because <laughs> I went another direction, something similar. I love, uh, I love this design. I have, uh, who cares about the why yeah, I mean, the whole okay. show was created to sell stuff. <laughs> exactly. Okay? That's yeah. why it exists. So, yeah. It exists to make um, money. It just does. <laughs> uh, I, I know there's a, there's a little extra layers there on that, but uh, but it's so cool and it's such a, a critical part of Trek over the last 50 plus years. I love it. And it's even a great little uh, place to hide a map. Like in right. the forge. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Idic with the secret map. Ross, yeah. what's your take on the Idic? I thought your description of that was really beautiful, Jen. It was really, really touching, actually. All the, everything you said was really quite emotional. So uh, very powerful stuff. Um, what I like about the Idic is I think it's taken on a life of its own almost outside of Star Trek as well. The, the, the symbol and the idea of infinite diversity and infinite combinations I think people who enjoy Star Trek really have taken this message to heart and it, it's a way of sort of celebrating the fact that we can all be different, we can all enjoy something, the world's for all of us and, and it's better for having all of us in it. Uh, and I really think people express this on Twitter and, you know, when you meet, when you meet Trekkers in real life, this kind of value is really demonstrated. So it's a, it's a, it's a great pick and I think it's a pick that can represent us all. So perfect, uh, perfect for that. Yeah, and I also love that it's on the baseball caps for the yes. for the logicians. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, Ross. Logicians, I love that yeah. name. <laughs> Ross, name <laughs> so good. All right, Ross, what's your number three pick? So for the super round, I wanted to do something a little bit special. So this is my smallest shape. Mm. Five words. One side of a cube. Hashtag Harvey. And the episode is his way 
And the shape I'm talking about is a square. Specifically, when Vic Fontaine says to the group of DS9 crew, <laughs> you know what a square is, right? <laughs> oh, and so uh, the right response is, one side of a cube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is perfection. Oh, funny. It's perfection <laughs> ross i i i love this pick so so genius it's i mean it's literally talking about a shape and <laughs> yeah it's all, but it's describing it and it's, it's such a great scene because vic is describing he's, he's just explaining that he understands he's a hologram and that it makes him more savvy and able yep. to interpret. and and he uses some some 1960s lingo which i'd never a clyde and a harvey or a square, <laughs> right, right. and uh, you know, I don't know what any of these things are. A square, I know, <laughs> but it, it was very funny. It just really struck me as a funny sentence and a, a perfect shape reference for the super. It's the perfect Ross Webster pick, Jen. <laughs> any quick take on uh, Vic and his uh, calling those guys yeah. a square? Yeah, that well, that's definitely a Ross Webster pick. You're correct, <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I love this pick. It's amazing, and I'm a huge Vic Fontaine fan. Yes. Uh, I love him so much. And they, they do get a lot of mileage out of those jokes of, of his, his 60s lingo. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? That they don't get. And it's really cute. And, and I, uh, that's, a, that's a really funny pick. I love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So let's go to my soup round pick to close it out. Number three, my five words and a hashtag. Provider's graphic designer is lit. Hashtag 500 quat loots on awesome triangular hexagon arena floor. It is the Gamesters of Triskelion. <laughs> it's that awesome Triskelion arena floor that they're doing all the fighting on. It's definitely the first shape I thought of when uh, this topic popped into my head. And I just, for me, it's just such a memorable design, not only as kind of the, the logo for the Triskelions, but that awesome final fight sequence where you have to stay on your own color and jump around. And so it's, if you don't remember, I'm sure most people listening do, even those who maybe haven't seen that episode, it's basically a triangle, but with like flat points on the top. So it's actually a, like a six sided hexagon, but it's more triangular shape. And I just love the geometric nature of it, the symmetrical shapes inside. It's got these kind of angled, uh, yellow angles on a green background. They're pointing toward another triangular hexagon in the middle. And that image, that graphic design, that's been seared into my brain since I was <laughs> six years old. And I love it. And I knew it would be on this list as soon as uh, as soon as I came up with this topic. So... The arena floor from the Gamesters of Triskelion. Jen, what's your take on that one? I am so glad you picked this because this was literally the first thing that popped into my head too. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when we started talking about shapes, because it is, it's so memorable. And I love that they 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 use it as I, I mean, as part of the plot, you know, like, like you said, yeah. you have to stay on your color. I mean, they, they don't. Like, they are I love not this. very good at that. <laughs> yes, they do, Jen. Yes, they do. No. <laughs> they set up all these rules for this fight, and then nobody follows any of them. It's <laughs> so true. <laughs> but it's, it's still, like, it's so funny. It's so memorable, and that's an awesome pick. It, that, the shape really blasts you in the face as well, because you're looking yeah. down on it. But so much right, of the episode, right. you're just looking down at the characters walking across it. It's right there, um, yeah. and it's wonderful they actually use it as part of the as part of the, the fight at the end. It's not just a, a thing they're walking on; it's actually a game a game floor. You're playing on it. Uh, yep. Great, wonderful pick. Yeah. No, no I, I was just going to add too because yeah, because you know you're looking at it for above, and and, it, and then because it's painted as if it's a game, it it kind of also makes it a little bit more. Um, a little bit more gruesome mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like to them it's a game but to the, the poor people who are fighting it's not a game so it makes it a little bit more you know it's a, a more. good point to the providers right. it's, just, it's yeah. just a game board yeah i didn't right, even think right. of that. yeah mm -hmm. creepy all right one of my favorites seared yeah. into my head since i was six years old all right let's go to round two jen what's your number two pick okay heartless villain or misunderstood creature hashtag shattered dreams this is the shape of the crystalline entity. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. From uh, Next Generation, uh, Season 5, Episode 4, yeah. Silicon Avatar. 
So I just love the shape of this creature. If you don't look closely, sure, you know, at first it just kind of looks like a big snowflake. <laughs> but then somehow you start with a snowflake and then somehow they manage to convey the sentience of this thing. It, it starts as a snowflake, but then it branches. All these branch clusters come off of it, flowing from the center. And, it, and to me, it always brings to mind, you know, like electrical networks mm, or even... A, a nervous system, yeah. Yeah, a nervous system. So you can kind of imagine that this thing would be sentient actually alive and not just you know a, a snowflake um this looks you know like a creature that eats electromagnetic energy and communicates in graviton pulses <laughs> and and they convey that with the shape uh, i i feel like like the artist got the assignment of making a big giant space snowflake um but then after the fact got the note of okay now make it a big giant space snowflake that's also an unstoppable killing machine. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and just adding those little branches off to make it look menacing. Uh, but it's beautiful and it's elegant. And the, the HD um, redesign of it is, is gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, but it stays true. To, you know, it's the original shape that, that, that makes it special. And, and um, it's really sad when it shatters. Not just, you know, just also, you know, in the universe, but also, oh, you know, I want to see more of this thing. Dr. Marr, Heartless. Yes, I know. Oh, I love that episode. That's actually one of a, a, a personal favorite episode of mine. I love this pick. I will say, though, in your five words and a hashtag question, I am going with Heartless Villain. I feel like the, I feel like the Chris Lainelli was working with Lore, and when it Ooh, killed okay. those, those settlers, I don't know. It seemed I don't pretty know. brutal. I don't know. Maybe it was just yeah. eating. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I, I, what, you know, someone makes an analogy about like a whale eating a school of fish, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. and I kind of, so I, I might be, I kind of think that if, if Picard had been able to uh, speak to this thing, they could have got it to, they could have set something up for it, <laughs> yeah. you know, for, for yeah. electromagnetic energy that it needs without hurting people. I really do think so. Yeah. Who knows? We'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know unless there's another one out there. <clears throat> took it upon herself to make that choice for everyone. So, Regardless, it is an awesome shape. Ross, what's your take on the crystalline entity? It's beautiful. And it's a perfect design to sort of highlight the ambiguity between is it alive? Is it constructed? Is it natural? Is it unnatural? We, we don't know what it wants to do. Well, that's not true. We do know what it wants to do. It wants to eat every planet. Um, but we don't know why it's doing that. Is it, is it just instinct? Is it just hunger? But then you're right. It has been contacted by law. Or did he just sort of signal it, sort of indicate there were some tasty treats down on this planet? So I, I think it's one. Of, and I do think you do get that classic Star Trek sympathy at the end, whereby we've we've actually made a connection with a life form that is so completely different to us and we've then we've broken contact with it in the worst possible way by destroying it before we could really understand what was going on and whether we could do something about it so it is beautiful and heartbreaking so i'll, I'll err on the side of misunderstood benefit of the doubt yeah i love it that's a great pick uh ross how about you what's your round two pick round two pick five words next generation starships next generation hashtag new vertiform and i have picked the <laughs> enterprise emergent life form oh man less of a distinct shape more like just a merging of lines and patterns sort of luminous tubular entanglement very irregular very 90s screensaver. Do you remember those? And the pipes you can see <laughs> yes, everywhere. Oh, right. <laughs> has a sort of M.C. Escher optical illusion feel to it. Uh, and it's just, it's wild. You know, uh, this, is, this is what the Enterprise offspring looks like. I could never have imagined this. Just this weird structure, tricolored structure with a, a bolt of light in the middle. Beautiful, amazing. The Enterprise consciousness is a very distinctive, cool shape. It definitely was out there when they when that whole episode was out there. Yeah, I <laughs> definitely have grown in a an appreciation of for it over the years. And yeah, that's a cool design and just a wacky kind of bonker shape. To I mean, it literally is. It's representing the Enterprise emerging consciousness it's crazy yeah, and it's, it's a crazy like a living marble rub i don't know it's just so <laughs> weird no uh, it's so cool uh jen what's your take on the enterprise consciousness and emergence 
yeah that that is a great pick i, I <laughs> it's so interesting and, and the, th the thing i also like about it is the color scheme like it's, it's a real it's a really 90s color scheme you know because it, it's neon but it's not quite neon you know yeah. what i mean it's got the reds and the purples and the, the deeper blues too but uh but it's really interesting. That's that's such a brilliant pick. It's great. It totally looks like a '90s sports team logo. It does. Uh, it right? totally does. Yeah. <laughs> Big, obnoxious kind of. Uh, okay, I love emergence. That is genius. Let's. Uh, so we have two kind of uh, living entities so far. Ooh. Round two, but not with my pick. My round two pick. Five words and a hashtag. Vulcan game of intense strategy yeah. hashtag I like the way it looks now <laughs> and it is the jumble of rods that turns into a perfect sphere the Kalto Vulcan game I love Kalto I love it love it love it I think it's just a brilliant concept from the writers the way the kind of spatial geometry of the game and and uh I picked Riddles as my episode just because it's the episode where Tuvok's trying to play it and he doesn't like it at all. And they're telling him the rules. It's just a jumbled rod. And he says, uh, I like the way it looks now. <laughs> it's just one of my favorite track lines. I love it. <laughs> Again, I always describe it. I love that Tuvok line where he describes it by saying, Calto is to chess as chess is to tic-tac-toe. It is just the <laughs> coolest design. I love the whole concept. And uh, yeah, one of my favorites. So Jen, what's your take on Calto? Yes, I'm so glad you picked this. This was my toughest cut. All right. Uh, I love the, the Vulcan Changa. <laughs> yeah, Vulcan Changa. I've never even thought of that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I, yeah, I think you, you could do a whole episode of, of just games. Uh, uh, some, that is on a long list. We are going to um, do it sometime. Yeah. I'll probably pick Calto again, but I could yeah. not pick it here. So. But, yeah, and it's funny because it, it, both the chaos shape and the order shape are really, really interesting. And you can right. kind of, yeah, and you can kind of see, you know, without them actually, you know, explaining. <laughs> you can kind of see how this would be um, meditative, almost for Vulcans. Yeah, you know what I mean to just bring order to chaos, and it's, it's, I love that design. Oh, great pick. Yeah, they they describe the game by saying it's not about striving for balance, but about finding the seeds of order even in the midst of chaos. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great. Oh, I wish I could play Calto. Me too. Uh, <laughs> Ross, what's your take on Calto? It's a beautiful game, isn't it? And when it transforms from its chaotic structure to its order structure, it's sort of like a, a flash of light. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes like a bit cheating. I think I want to see it move. I want to see it go. But actually, it, that's not what you're looking for, is it? You're looking for that, that conscious change, that sort of cognitive change. I've made this move. Now things will be perfect. And it, it's just, a, yeah, both shapes are wonderful. Uh, great idea, great pick. Well, it's also great when you place a, a rod and then the whole thing just goes clank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't happen to Beam of Light, did it? That's yeah. like... <laughs> All right, let's go to round one and pick our top shapes in Trek. Jen, what's your number one pick? All right, my number one pick makes an accurate first impression. Hashtag unmistakably Cardassian. This is the shape of the Gaylor class Cardassian warship. Ooh, okay. Right? And this is uh, the episode I picked was Deep Space Nine, season one, episode one, Emissary. Yep. So I love the shape of this ship <laughs> because just by looking at it, you know that this is the ship of a reptilian looking bad guy. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, like, but they managed to convey that not in a cartoony way, you know, and it's, it's this very subtle way. Um, you know, like it's got, you know, the forked tail on the elongated oval shape. Um, it, it's, it's shaped, it, it always reminded me uh, of an Egyptian ankh. Oh yeah. Almost. And yeah. yeah. And when I was looking into this, I, I found out that that was intentional. That's what they were going for. They wanted to sort of invoke uh, the pharaohs, you know, since hmm. the Cardassians had slaved the Bajorans. And so they use like the desert colors and, and the accent colors are like sarcophagus, the colors of, that's like on a sarcophagus. Wow. Um, and that really came across, uh, but, it, but it's in such a subtle way, you know, which is the brilliance of it. Um, this is, this is a, a rich uh, Sturmach design. 
Yep. And I, f- I found an article uh, when I was going through this that, that uh, had a great quote from him that sort of really ties into our, our shapes topic uh, about the Gaylor class. You know, he said, I- I'm a big fan of iconic shapes or more correctly, shapes that somehow remind you of something without beating you over the head with it. Hmm. And I love that quote because that's exactly, that perfectly describes why I love the shape of the Gaylor class. And that's, it does exactly that. You might not know why it fits the Cardassians so well, but just does. And, and they used it, they use it to great effect. They, they actually, the, the first time you see these ships, it's actually in TNG's The Wounded. And it's the first, and, right. and, and also an emissary, but they, they use the same gag in both, um, in both episodes where they show you the ship before they show you who's in the ship. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 our intro, and this is actually the first time we saw the Cardassians too in, in TNG, The Wounded. You know, our first introduction is the ship. And then they show you uh, what the Cardassians look like. Um, but I picked, I picked Emissary because it's Golden Cot's big entrance. Mm. So his ship it comes up to Deep Space Nine and Cisco, Cisco looks at the monitor, you know, and he says, tell Gold Ducat, I look forward to meeting him, you know, in his deep Cisco voice, you know, yeah. but he says it to the ship because that ship's the perfect stand in for the Cardassians before you know who you're going to see, you know, and, and, and I, I just think it, it just, it's the ship that fits their inhabitants the best in the Trek universe to me. I love it. And I had to pick the emissary too, because there's a great part at the end where Cisco has to tow uh, the Prakash, uh, um, Ducat's uh, yeah, Gaylor class right. out of the wormhole yeah. <laughs> in a runabout, which is yep. just classic. I just love that. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's my favorite. I love that design. I, I think I always liked about it was kind of the way it, it's flat and then it kind of tears up the way the, yeah. the front of it kind of goes. It's like stacks up. I don't, I don't know how to describe yeah. it, but that is a great, great, great shape. And so definitive for Trek. Ross, what's your take on the Galore class? It does have a very iconic look, a very almost organic look as well. And you're saying yeah. sort of, sort of the desert theme of it. You can almost see it could be a burrowing sand, you know, sand burrowing creature. Right. And then it, it always, the, presumably the the design of the Cardassian symbol as well is based on yes. one came first and the other came first because they look very similar but it's wonderful to see that design come to life and be you know it's not just a flat design it is actually a 3D ship which is going to travel through space so it's nice sort of continuation of the design there yeah great yeah choice. awesome awesome pick all right Ross how about you what's your number one pick number one pick Ireland's coast in the machine, hashtag Giants Causeway. I've picked the Vija steps, uh, the hexagonal <laughs> steps, walking down to Vija as you step off the Enterprise saucer onto Vija itself. They're the steps you step onto. When I saw this when I was young, my mind was blowing. I was like, what? What is it? I don't believe it. It's just like the Giant's Causeway. But what does that mean? I couldn't understand. It's, it's so organic. It's so Earth-related. But it's so bizarre and so unusual. I was, I was, having a, I was going crazy. And that has stuck with me. The, 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 the final 10 minutes of, of the motion picture have stuck with me my entire life. And those steps started it. As soon as you step off the source onto those steps, wild. That those hexagonals, they become more and more irregular, and then you're stepping down to the heart of Vija itself, where the original, uh, the original Voyager probe is. Mind blowing, wild, and uh, this is the first thing that I thought of when you suggest when the shapes were suggested. Those hexagonal irregular shapes, I absolutely love. There's so many of them, and it's such a distinctive shape, and it's the shape is all about the scene and it's i just rewatched the uh the director's cut and it's so much it's done so much better on that one i wish that was out on blu-ray but it's not and and that scene really stuck with me it's just a few weeks ago i watched that fantastic pick that is a legendary trek moment the hexagonal steps for viger <laughs> down to viger i love it uh jen what's yeah. your take on that one no i agree that's a great pick it's 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 iconic and it, it's and interesting it's it's that's a great pick <laughs> it's such a it's such a bonkers idea yeah yeah to, to have that kind of connect to the saucer section and have them walk down super uh <laughs> super cool all right ross fantastic your uh picks did not disappoint 
as I would have expected. Okay, let's close it out. My number one pick, a little bit of a homer pick. This is the one I did not go with the idic. My uh, five words and a hashtag, light up pyramid guides to POW and Spock, and hashtag enterprise to discovery, and it is the Kirshara. And <laughs> I, this pick has nothing to do with the fact I did pick the the episode is Awakening. That's the one that <laughs> happens to be the episode I was in. It happens to be the episode where they found the Kishara. Uh, but it has nothing to do with that. It kind of does, maybe a little bit. But I just love this cool shape and look. And it's, it's this is the pyramid shape of the of of the Vulcan relic that houses Surak's writings, and I just remember from that episode loving it when they when they first kind of grabbed it. But it's the end when when Archer lights it up and it's got all the the writings of Surak floating around the room, and that was fantastic enough. But then we just saw it a couple of weeks ago on discovery in the episode light and shadows in season two, when Spock is in the Kotrick arc and there's a Kirshara there. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the exact same one. Yeah. You know? I was pretty giddy when I saw that. So <laughs> I, I love that pyramid shape. It's super iconic. I love the, the etchings on it, that it lights up and it's pretty special for me as well. So I picked the Kirshara instead of the Itic, which was definitely on my list as well. So Jen, what's your take on the Kirshara? Yeah, you had to pick it. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a cool shape and, and it, 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 it does. I mean, it looks like a relic, you know what I mean? It has a, a, a relic look to it, but it's also, I don't know why, but it's, it's, it's just oddly Vulcan. Right. Mm-hmm. And I can't put my finger on why, you know what I mean? Which makes it a really good design, you know? Yeah, it definitely feels Vulcan. And I love that it's that Discovery has included it. Yeah, that, Such that a really fascinating. Those yeah. little links really expand the universe, and it's yeah. so beautiful to see them take these little pieces and maybe not, you know, dwell on it so much, but let it be known that we know, we know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we know what would be in one of these cabins. <laughs> so a beautiful choice uh, and yes. uh, completely appropriate for you, Jim. But, yes, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for indulging me on. Uh, on well, that your podcast, you do it your own. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's rattle off some secondary systems picks. Jen, what do you got on your uh, just missed list? Okay, so um, we talked about some of mine, uh, but I also had uh, the Culver Starburst. Oh, from the first duty. Oh, I, I had that on my secondary systems. That was my last <laughs> one. Yeah, because it's super cool. I can see why they wanted to do that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, you could you know? see why they wanted to do it. It's so great. Yes. And I just yes. like saying Culver and Starburst. So yes. <laughs> I did not think of that one, and I love it. Brilliant. Um, I also had uh, Jordy's visor. Uh, oh yeah. Shape because anyone who was into hair clips in the 1980s <laughs> did the same thing I did and took a banana clip and put it on their face and pretended <laughs> to be Jordy because it's the exact same shape. <laughs> so that one's just like a personal, you know, favorite. And also, um, this one is just really random, but I'm glad I finally have a place to say it. But I love the chair in Di- uh, Deanna Troy's office, counseling office, the one that she sits in when she's with a patient. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll send you guys a picture. But I swear, if a wizard turned Marina Sirtis into a chair, it would be that one. It looks like it's. You know, what, what I mean? it looks like it's her it. in chair form because it, it's purple, like that one outfit that Troy has. It's the same shade of purple, and it's curvy and inviting, and and it and it, it's on it's on like this one post that swivels. You know. Yeah. So and and it, it, it looks like low key it looks like she's on a throne when she's in it and the way she poses with it and it just frames her perfectly and i just adore it that's <laughs> so ringing like, a, it's I'm ringing like, a bell now your yeah, description yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe it's just also just the way she poses in it like it looks like it's an extension of her it helps make it look like she's someone that you would want to you know share all your you know, secrets <laughs> I just adore that shape, the shape of that chair. So I'm glad I finally was able to get that one off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Ross, how about you? What's your secondary systems look like? My my hardest cut was the whale probe. And oh my! I didn't think of that. It's one of my all time favorites. That, 
that was my that was my hardest cut. I literally <sighs> sliced oh, it out think of that about five minutes before we before I phoned you guys. <laughs> I I even got a five words and a hashtag for it because I was so. Do it. Was God, I'm right so there. glad you you brought this up. So glad. What what's your five words? Projects rotating orb, broadcast <laughs> in dangers. Hashtag yes. space cetacean. <laughs> the whale probe cylinder and ball oh god it's so, so massive good. i love it so much it's, but i did just cut it out just at the last minute it's one of the best designs in trek history it's because it's just so abstract and completely out there and you never see anything like it no and where it's coming from so I prominent it. i love it so cool my other mother my pick that i would i really like the idea of mainly for the name was uh Paradise and the box, Deep Space Nine's Paradise. Uh, <laughs> that's a, the idea that it was the box, and you know yeah. that's the shape in itself. <laughs> um, and I had a feed from like, Batlets. Man, I love the shape of Batlets. Oh yeah, I, yep. uh, the sword of KLS particularly. I thought that was a beautiful redesign of a Batlet. I really like that. And the other thing that I could, I always think about are the Deep Space Nine doors, the, the yep. big rotating door cogs. I love those. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> like when they come so, off the ships, yeah. like the airlock. Yes, <laughs> those are great. Both of those were on my secondary systems, the Batleth <laughs> and the DS9 the gear wheel doors. The gear I had. wheel doors. I absolutely <laughs> love those. And then the, my, probably my, my strangest thing, in the offspring, before Data has made Lal into a female, Lal sort of wanders around in sort of a gold humanoid form. And just, the, I think the, the shape of, of Lal's face and that sort of weird chest piece, it, that that weird horizontal chest piece it always sticks in my mind for some reason. It's just such a an unusual design feature to have that little sort of angled bit sticking out the chest. I, I often think about that. It's such a weird little design, but I like that shape. It's got a cool, uh, distinctive shape. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's cool. And my my very last pick that I I thought about for a little while is the Terran Agonizer. Yes, <laughs> which has that in sort of inverted delta on the back of it. Yeah, uh, delta. That, that's cool, aren't they? That's a cool little shape and very distinctive as well. Awesome! I'm loving the secondary systems. So I had my toughest cut was uh, the food cubes from TOS. <laughs> the yeah, that's great. Yeah. Sequencer food slots because it's just perfect. I also had Delta Insignia on my secondary systems. I had a Vedic hat. I love the uh, shape of the Vedic oh, yeah. hat. Oh, that is lovely. That is wonderful. The Vedic hat. That yeah. is beautiful. Like the uh, Sydney Opera House. Yes. Let's see, you mentioned a couple, Ross. I had the Horta silicon eggs. I love those uh, spheres. I did not think of that. That is gorgeous, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the DS9 wormhole, too. That's a they, mm. that oh. really cool, distinctive shape, the way it kind of... So beautiful. Staggers itself when it's uh, when it's twisting, and my special shout out. This is we're gonna we're gonna get our uh, mature rating for this episode. My special <laughs> shout out is Kirk's Stalastite Rock. <laughs> and what are little girls made of? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, everybody. But uh, we could not do this show oh, without no. mentioning that <laughs> shit. Um, all right, and nobody mentioned. I was wondering if this was going to come up. I had it on my nobody mentioned list. All the crazy glyphs and everything that we see in masks. The, oh yeah, I thought the episode. About that. Yeah. yeah, like Corgano's moon yeah. and Osaka. <laughs> so, all right, fantastic deep cut conversation here on Trek Ranks. It's what we do, but now it's time to move into our regeneration cycle and wind it all down. Computer, activate regeneration cycle. Alcoves beta and gamma. Okay, going to recap our picks here really quick. So, Jen, run through your uh, top five. Okay, number five, I had the self-sealing stem bolt. Uh, Deep Space Nine, season one, episode 15, Progress. Number four, I had the Ushan Tor uh, from Enterprise, season four, episode 13, United. Number three... I had the Vulcan Idic, uh, Enterprise Season 4, Episode 21, Terra Prime. Number two, the Crystalline Entity from TNG, Season 5, Episode 4, Silicon Avatar. 
Uh, and my number one pick was uh, the Gaylor class Cardassian warship from uh, Deep Space Nine, season one, episode one, Emissary. I love it. Your you spread it around pretty good. You had two from Deep Space Nine, two from Enterprise, and one from TNG. An awesome list of joyous shapes. <laughs> and, and Ross, how about you? What's your top five? My number five was the yellow holographic grid from the holodeck. Last seen in Enterprise episode, These Are the Voyages. My number four was the ominous Borg cube. Uh, and my episode was uh, Scorpion part one. My number three pick was the word square from <laughs> from uh deep space nine season six episode 20 his way my number two pick was the emergent life form from next generation episode emergence and my number one pick was the hexagonal giants causeway style vija steps <laughs> from the historic motion picture that is spectacular. So I'm not sure if you planned it, but you had one each from TOS, TNG, D Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. You know, I did not plan it, but I was I'm very pleased. That That's amazing. Out. And and you went in reverse order on that. So you went in, in order of shows from Enterprise to uh through the TOS with number one. Can we pretend I did that on purpose? That, <laughs> yeah, <that>? yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it was in the back of your head somewhere. Oh, yeah, definitely. Plenty. All right. My top five, number one was the silhouettes of the Enterprise nacelles and the DS9 pylons. And I chose Trials and Tribulations from Deep Space Nine as my episode. Number four, the Bajoran insignia. And I used Explorers from Deep Space Nine, the little Bajoran window on the light ship. Number three, the Arena floor from the gamesters of triskelion from tos my number two pick was the calto game the vulcan strategy game from riddles from voyager and my number one homer pick from enterprise awakening the kirshara love that design so let's see so we discovery and kelvin did not get any picks but we spread it around pretty good on the uh, OG five, the original five series with TOS, TNG and Voyager each having two picks each enterprise had four and deep space nine had five leading the way. So pretty good spread around there. I tried to like keep track of how many different types of shapes we had, but we literally had all, all of them. I mean, squares and circles and pyramids and prisms and rectangles. All the high flyers, all of them. <laughs> yeah, so there was no way to track all those, but basically almost one of everything. All right, that was awesome. But as we do every week, we have once again entered a temporal causality loop. So before we can depart, it's time to hear from you. The Enterprise has been caught up in a temporal causality loop, and I suspect that something similar may have happened to you. This week, our temporal causality loop is flashing back to episode 51 and the second part of our top five ships show, and that's the one on relationships. So here are some of the standout submissions with five words and a hashtag summary. I'm going to start with a full list from Lynn Payne at Lynn, L-L-A-P on Twitter. I loved her list. She had Troy and Worf. Five words, it shouldn't work, but does. Hashtag opposites attract. And she had parallels as her episode. Her number four was uh, Cayman and Aline from The Inner Light. Tell them of us, my darling. Hashtag a lifetime in 25 minutes. I love that pick. That's a heartbreaking pick. Uh, I know. Yeah. I know. That's a real relationship. I know. Now over an entire up. life. So oh, good. Crumbs. Her, uh, her number three was from Life Signs, the Doctor and Donara Pell. My programming has adapted. Hashtag now that you are here. Great pick. Aww. I love her number two because it was one of the picks that I made as well was Quark and Grilka from Looking for Parmok in All the Wrong Places. Funnest couple in Star Trek. Hashtag worth more than Latinum. And her number one is really, really good. Odo and Loxana. 
from the muse the day i stop being alone hashtag hide and go seek i love that pick i love that pick one of my favorite little low-key moments in star trek is when um you know loxana is falls asleep on odo and he changes his arm into a blanket yep. covers her and that's yep. such a sweet moment oh yep. i love that that's that b story in the muse is really good yeah yeah, so. yeah. well yeah the b story is the breakout part of that yes yeah. <laughs> Let's not talk about the A story. <laughs> we don't being stuck in a lift and having two characters have to deal with each other. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, all right, another pick, another another great list. I can read off a couple from Dr. Jen H, who is at Dr. Jen Rose on Twitter. She had from schisms, data and spot, Aww. a true and valued friendship. Hashtag love poetry. And then her another one on her list was Bashir and Garrick from Our Man Bashir. Mm-hmm. Long lunches, <laughs> secrets, and lies. Hashtag it's all true. A great ship. Uh, okay, they Carl. Are. Yeah, Carl wonders mm-hmm. at listening to film had a great, great, great pick. One that I'd never thought of before. He had Savick and David Marcus in a <laughs> ship. And his hash, his five words of a hashtag realized only on the page hashtag missed opportunity. So that that's a that's actually really good. I could see them together. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and Heather Kirby, who is at Nerdy Gal thirty three, had uh, two that we're going to relay. One is Lorca and Cornwell. <laughs> uh, five words of a hashtag the only one who sees hashtag through the mirror. And then she also had Pike and Vina, which uh, is really appropriate this year. Something real through the illusions. Hashtag a cage isn't always a prison. Oh, I lo- yeah, the Pike a- and Vina pick. I love it because the, that recent episode. Uh, oh, so good. What, what was the Discovery episode where Vina appeared recently? I if memory serves. If memory serves. Oh, cl- yeah, ironic. Uh, if, if memory <laughs> serves. <laughs> if memory serves. I absolutely love that Vina yeah. came back in that episode. It was so, so well done. Good so much depth to that game. It legit made the menagerie better to me. I completely yeah. agree. You know? I completely agree. I, I love I, that. I basically tweeted that. It's I could not agree more. It's incredible. <laughs> and it was an excellent act. And the casting was so well done. So good. They, they've really, for Pike and Vina, mm-hmm. yeah. that was nice. So good. All right, one last list of ships from our good friend Adam Uno, who is the author of The True Adventures of Moriarty, at Moriarty Stories on Twitter, and his top five ships in Star Trek were number five, Moriarty and Barkley. Number four, <laughs> Moriarty and Pulaski. Number three, <laughs> Moriarty, Countess Regina Bartholomew. Number two, Moriarty and Data. And his number one was Moriarty and Picard. <laughs> so I love that list because that is hilarious. All right. Thanks again to everyone for all the amazing responses to Trek Ranks, which uh, have again allowed us to navigate our way out of this temporal causality loop. So put your own list together and tweet them to me at Trek Ranks so we can hear from you as well. And you can give us a call at the Tricorder Transmissions at 609-512-5527 at 609-512-LLAP and leave us your list there as well of your top five ships. So hopefully we'll hear from you so you can be featured on the next episode of Trek Ranks. And on the next episode of Trek Ranks, we are hitting a topic that's been on our list for a while. And it's a topic that I think will give us some more pretty great deep cut picks. So we're doing our top five underappreciated characters. So for that, you can pick anything you want, a series regular, a recurring character, a one-time character, somebody that you think is underappreciated out there in fandom. Mm -hmm. So Jen and Ross, what's jumping out at you guys right away that you might include on your list of top five underappreciated characters? Jen. Okay. Keiko O'Brien. Yes. I am oh. sick of her being underappreciated. Yes. I, I, I could do a whole diatribe on this. I won't, but I'll just say. Thank you. She is one of the few people that stands up to Kai Wen right to her face. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and, <laughs> and she's so fierce. satisfying. Yes. And she's fierce and she's brilliant. And I get if you don't like her, the dynamic between her and Miles, I don't care for that either together they're not that great but apart they are both fantastic characters and i think she gets 
maligned for that their dynamic and miles doesn't and gee i wonder why that is yeah. <laughs> but she, and, and I'll, I'll stop but, <laughs> I'll stop, but she's, she's awesome great great pick totally agree i love keiko yeah. we are team keiko here yes. at trek ranks all right ross how about you underappreciated character i'm thinking the one-offs uh, at the end of at the end of voyager in the the series four five and six four five six and seven there are so many characters i wish would make a comeback and this is going to sound strange, but I always think the think tank would have made a great mm-hmm. recurring enemy. And they're such a, mm. an unusual bunch of characters. They are not, you know, they're, they're obviously not great people, not, not the nicest of folks. <laughs> perhaps there's some good in them as well, potentially. Perhaps they could be helping out. Yeah, they I cured the like, phage. Exactly. Well, they said they did. <laughs> okay, exactly. I, I, like exactly. The, I like the idea of it. <laughs> Um, but I thought there was a lot of moral ambiguity there, and I thought they could really come back and pose some interesting challenges to the Voyager crew. And we never saw them again. I always thought it was such a such a mini tragedy. I am extremely excited for this topic now because the think tank is a brilliant pick. I thought you were going to say something like Tal Celeste, who uh, from oh. Voyager, who is probably not really underappreciated because. She- no one really knows who she is, but I love her. <laughs> okay. I can't place her. I can't place Tessa Celeste. You, you can't? Oh, no, I can't. It's going out of my mind. She's kind of the... She was in Good Shepherd. Oh, yes. No, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Let's wrap this up. A huge thanks to Jen Tift and Ross Webster, the amazing hosts of Snap Trek. Everybody, go check out Snap Trek. It is awesome. Thanks, guys. Any final Trek thoughts before we wrap it up here, uh, Jen? No, just thanks so much. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun and a really interesting topic. Who would have thought? You know that yeah. just shapes there be so many different ways to look at it, and, and it was a lot of fun. So thank you, Jim. Who would have thought, Ross? Man, great to finally have you on, buddy. I really appreciated it. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed thinking about shapes all week, putting my five <laughs> words down. And just chatting to you guys has been absolutely immense. So thank you. Fantastic. I look forward to the next time already. All right. So thanks again, everyone, for engaging with us here on episode 56 of the Trek Ranks podcast. As always, I want to close by saying I'm looking forward to standing with you again here in this place where I belong. I know what you're thinking. He has pretty sweet pipes for a light bulb. (laughs) Light bulb? That's what I am, right? Collection of... Photons and force fields? You know, your basic heuristic, fully interactive hologram? He knows he's a hologram? Felix designed him that way. He thought it would give him the right attitude for the era. If you're going to work Vegas in the 60s, you better know the score. Otherwise, you're going to look like a Clyde. A Clyde? A Harvey, you know. Harvey? A square. You know what a square is, right? It's one side of a cube. <laughs> well, I guess that answers my question. Hi there, thanks again for listening. If you're cruising the galaxy looking for even more Trek talk, why not visit our good friends Bill and Dan over at trekgeeks.com? They've got a great podcast that covers a wide range of Star Trek topics, so you're sure to find something you'll love. And if you're in the mood for some awesome tunes, then you really need to head over to 5 The guys are writing a song for every episode of the original series, and each one is absolutely brilliant. So that's trekgeeks.com and 5 Check them out today. The object of the game is to turn this jumbo of rods into a perfect sphere. We take turns positioning our pieces. Whoever gets the shape to appear first, wins. I like the way it looks now.